syllabus about the date a week from Monday. I had listed it as the 7th, it's actually the 6th. Um, so the homework is actually due on the 6th, the next assignment, not the one that's due today. Uh, and I'll try and remember to send you out, uh, you know, an email too for people. It is the 7th Monday. Well, why did I say the 8th? Then I looked on my calendar, maybe I was looking at the wrong. If the 7th is Monday and Wednesday, Okay, maybe it is. I miss, may, if it's the seventh is Monday, forget about this. Somehow I looked at a calendar today and I got confused. Maybe I saw Sunday as the sixth. I was right. Thank you for correcting me. Uh, yeah, because this Sunday is the thirtieth, so it would be the sixth. So, because uh, thirty days. Is, yeah, October is thirty-one days. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so now I want to talk about rays going in the other direction, basically. What we've been doing so far is we've been starting rays from the eye or from a camera lens, and we've gone out into the scene, hit surfaces, and tried to figure out how they were lit. And so the path tracing that you'll have to do for a week from Monday uh, is going to keep bouncing out, maybe on a perfect mirror direction, but for this next assignment, uh, for a week from Monday, you have to account for diffuse illumination from all directions. And so the path tracing is going from your eye and reflecting off a surface, reflecting off another surface, and if we're lucky, eventually getting to a light source. It's supposed to be a bulb in, in a lighting fixture somewhere. Um, so what I want to talk about today is the opposite. Tracing photons from the light source and bouncing them around. And if we're lucky, you'd have to be pretty lucky for that to happen, you get into the lens or your eye. It's a similar problem to the uh, forward path, I sh you know, which is called forward. Forward from your eye because traditionally since witted, people have been tracing rays in the opposite direction. So they call this backward ray tracing from the light source. But really, it is following the directions of the photon. The original ray tracing philosophy was the one that was backwards. But that's a historical term now. So, and the problems are similar. The problem of bouncing and ever hitting a small light source is unlikely, which is why unless you did a special pass for the shadow per numbers where you particularly aim rays at the light source, you get a very noisy image. Right? If you did Russian roulette just on straight path tracing, you know, and one suppose one in a hundred rays actually hit the light source. You'd have to have an awful lot of rays to reduce the variance, otherwise most of your pixels would be black and if you would be very bright, brighter than you could display. Well, it's the same problem if you start the photons from the light source and then, you know, when they actually go inside the lens, say they refract, which you could do by the lens equation and actually figure out what point on the CCD sensor they hit, you know, very few of them would actually get in the camera lens. And you have a similar noise problem. So, there ought to be a corresponding solution which is analogous to tracing the direct illumination rays to the light source to trace an extra ray at every bounce or an extra collection of rays at every bounce to see if it gets in the camera. So these problems are basically the inverse of each other. And in fact, there are ways involving something called importance or bidirectional ray tracing that we'll uh, discuss later on in the succeeding weeks for how to sort of try and solve them both simultaneously. And so another thing I should point out, one of the deadlines that really is due a week from Monday is uh, what you want to do for your final project. And so you can be reading ahead in the book, you can be looking at the list of the papers that I gave you, which is far from exhaustive. It's just the ones that I happen to have in my folder for things I had lectured on when I taught this course last. Um, for what you want to do for a final project and propose it 
by email to me by the close of a week from Monday, and we can, you know, I'll either okay it or I'll suggest something. I just want to get you pinned down on time. That's the day that the previous one is due, because then after that we'll have the rest of the quarter to do the, the uh, project. And, you know, as of already a couple lectures ago, I told you everything you need to do to do this basic path tracing from your eye to get the color bleeding and the uh, shadow penumbras, which are two things we haven't yet gotten with our distributed ray tracing so far. So the, f the formal way of studying this mathematically is a little bit complicated. In fact, every time I read it, I get confused. And I'm going to do the best I can on it. Um, the reason it's even more complicated than the way they present it in the book is because we're now, when we talk about things like depth of, of field, we're talking about a lens. So the ray isn't just going through a pinhole and corresponding directly to a pixel. So one way to think of it is to study either rays that come directly to the pixel. Here's a pixel X and here's a direction theta from the inner surface of the lens, in which case if you were ray tracing them, you'd have to trace the refraction of the lens, which is equivalent to the lens equation. Or the way we were doing it, we had points on the lens, and I didn't show the refraction, but you know this ray <coughs> bends a little bit when it comes through the lens, and maybe is going in a different direction than this one, but there's some direction theta that we compute from the lens equation. And for people who haven't succeeded in doing it yet and are trying to get it done by midnight today, if I have time at the end of the period, I'll tell you more details of how to do that in the context of this reference software package that I put up on the net. Uh, but anyway, we'll think of rays starting here and going out into the scene. And each of them has a certain contribution to all the pixels, or to a few pixels, according to your anti-aliasing filter. So what we're going to say, if uh, we have a set S, is a collection of positions and directions. So how should I do it? It's a collection of these ordered pairs, right? For a simple pixel, it would be all the rays that started out from that pixel and went up to the pix inside the area of the pixel in a direction that got them to the lens. And, and then you'd have to refract them through the lens into the scene. Or it could be a set of points on the surface of the lens. This would be the whole surface. And then theta could be the set of directions from that, you know, I guess truly going into that point, that refract into the area of a pixel. And so we can assign this importance, emitted importance, to x theta is 1 if x theta is an element of s and 0 otherwise. But it wouldn't have to be 1, right? It could be this filter function, h of x theta, namely you follow this ray through the lens and figure out where it hits and then according to its distance from the center of a pix the pixel, you weight it by the filter function. But whatever it is, it's a function of rays which measure the contribution of the rays to that pixel. So just like you can think of radiance propagating, emitting from light sources and coming into the scene, you can think of importance to a pixel. Or it could be later, you might, if you really wanted to do some of the important sampling, like the paper by uh, Smits et al. on uh, radiosity importance. I'll talk about radiosity next week, too. Uh, you might want to look at what's the importance to all pixels at once in the whole scene, in which case the S is really the region of all the pixels on the CCD. But in any case, you can think of that propagating out into the scene, and every surface on every scene has an importance to that pixel, which is the fraction of the radiance leaving that 
surface at that pixel. In other words, we can have a point Y here and a direction Psi, could be any direction, and it's the fraction which represents the contribution of this flux to this pixel. <coughs> so if you didn't have that H, it would either contribute or not. Otherwise, it's going like this, with a, with a number 0 or 1. And it either contributes directly, or from a surface like this, it could contribute by bouncing, and then get there. So this one contributing directly, we could call W emitted Y going to Psi. Right, so we, ch we change the direction of this arrow because this was coming into X and this is going out of Y. And, and it's, you can think of the importance being emitted by the first surface that's seen at that pixel. And So we can write uh, an equation just like we had the radiosity and we were, what did I call it? Radiance. We were solving it for every point on every surface where it's sort of the source of it was the uh, emitted radiance from light sources. This or this coming from either the point on the picture or the first surface visible at that point is the emitted importance. And the total importance is emitted importance plus reflected importance. So I'm using this notation. Well, let's see. In the book they called it Z. Uh, Maybe I should do that because this, in, in this sense, this is the Z. This is the reflect, this is the importance that got here by reflecting off of another surface. And uh, so it's the ref basic, the reflectance from Y and angle theta reflecting in direction, coming in from C and reflecting in direction minus theta times the importance coming into Y from this direction C. And we still have, uh, I added the, co the started on a new line, I still don't have room for this cosine factor. N Y C D omega C. Okay, so what we want is this, the flux capital Phi that comes onto this pixel through the lens. And we can say the flux Phi is the integral over the sphere at X. So X is either a point on the lens or if you want to think of the refraction, actually a point on the detector behind the lens of the total importance coming in this direction. Actually, I've got this arrow going this way. I must have copied it out of the book that way. L E Okay, so what does that mean? That means that This importance has propagated all the way to the light source and represents the fraction of the light coming from the light source, which is this emitted light, that's contributing to this X, at this, at, to the sensor. So X is actually a point on the light source, and this stands for the importance propagated all the way from the pixel through the lens to that light source surface according to the result of solving this equation. Probably you have to do that by a Monte Carlo method. And 
times the light source. Uh, and I guess you have to integrate it also over all of the areas of all the light sources. You integrate all the area over all the areas of the light source and all the uh, uh, all the directions. The either the zero one if the weight is like this, or the fraction if it's a if it's a filter of the light that actually contributes to that sensor. Or you could also write it as the, let's see if I've got that equation on the next page. If not, I'll do it from memory. I guess I didn't copy it. You could integrate it over the sensor. So this is light. And this is omega of the sensor of this WE. Right, so now it's actually the light coming into the lens here. But what you're integrating is the light at that first surface you see. Right? That's how that's directly how the light you see and, and that and to do that you have to solve the uh radiance equation to get L. coming in. So I need uh, dA and d omega psi on each of these. <coughs> so you either solve for the radiance and then do an integral like I did last time to find out how it contributes to a pixel, or you solve for the importance everywhere including on the light sources and then you integrate the light leaving the light sources so in a sense these are symmetrical and the solution methods would be symmetrical so you could start from the light source and shoot photons for path tracing so shoot photons from the light sources proportional to oops it just broke on me again there and I'm going to say directional Uh, flux output, which is really radiant. Like uh, you could have a uh, spotlight that uh, was sort of focused to send light only in specific directions and then had a fall off at the edge. Or for some of these spotlights they have flaps, they call them barn door spotlights. Or for these lighting fixtures, because of the way the diffusers work, I can see the bulbs here and I can only see their reflections when I go back. So, you know, every luminaire, every light source that's manufactured, what the manufacturer will have in some sort of a standards document for how that light source works is how the output of the light depends on the direction. So, you know, we could have put that in, in, into uh, this formulation too, but it's pretty easy to do it. If you think of shooting out the photons, you can just, according to the light distribution as a function of angle away from, say, the center of the spotlight, you could uh, sample proportional to the flux that going out at that angle using this cumulative distribution function of whatever graph they give you from the lighting manufacturer. And you could shoot the photons out with the right uh, density representing proportional to the actual radiance from the light source going out in that direction. And then keep bouncing. On surfaces, Uh, using Russian roulette, say, as we did before, otherwise you're going to bounce forever. So every time you absorb or extinguish a photon, it goes to zero, and you don't keep tracing, and you compensate by taking one over the 
uh, probability of keeping going and multiplying the uh, photon energy by that. And basically, at each bounce, you're going to also, just like we did in the other direction, you're going to multiply by the BRDF and the uh, cosine term and divide by the probability. So you're doing exactly the same math. And if the photon ever reaches a detector uh, for a pixel, then uh, record its contribution. And it may hit more than one pixel, right? If, uh, in, if we think of the pixels having overlapping filter functions for like that triangle filter, we would record its, its contribution to all of them, just like we did last time for the samples in the sub-pixel uh, jittered sampling. And that's the one that would be very inefficient, right? That's the brute force path tracing. So if you have a small pupil or lens, the hit is very unlikely. But we can add a direct sensor contribution at every bounce. And the way you do that is similar to the way we trace the rays to the light source for uh, getting the direct illumination. We just pick a random point on the light source. So in this case, we'll pick a random point on the sensor. And before I call them shadow feelers or light feelers, well, what we can say in this case is trace. Um, I don't know a sensor feeler. Okay, so let me take the random point Q on the sensor and a point, uh, say, P on the surface. Right, so. Here is the point Q on the sensor, and here is a point P on the surface. And what we'll do is trace a ray. Well, it, I guess it's easier to, to pick it on here, because then we don't have to worry about refracting. It's a straight line. And we'll, we'll think of the sensors actually being on the front of the lens with the appropriate filter weight accounting for the lens equation effect on this uh, pixel here. And if there's an object in the way, there's no contribution. Otherwise, there's this a direct sensor contribution. And if, say, visibility P Q equals 1, that means it doesn't hit anything else between, then add in the flux at that pixel. So, you know, to add in that flux, you'd have to figure out the, the uh, BRDF coming from wherever the photon was coming into that point P and the direction of this shadow feeler. Just like you're going to have to do next time when you do the direct illumination. It's not a random direction. It's a specific direction. And so you do the inverse of what we had for the uh, direct illumination. So for very shiny surfaces, If you're looking at them directly with your eye and you see a shiny surface, it's better to bounce off the shiny surfaces like you did in the first assignment because 
if you do a shadow feeler from a back, I'm sorry, um, what did I call it? A sensor feeler for a shiny surface, and it's not exactly in the mirror direction, come your incoming direction, its contribution to the sensor will be zero. So for looking at very shiny surfaces or perfect mirror surfaces, it's better to trace rays from your eye. But suppose you had a light source and it reflected off a mirror or some shiny sphere or refracted through a glass bottle and, and made a sort of a caustic pattern on the, on the table. Like you see if you, if you have you know, light coming in the window, coming through a wine bottle or something, it makes a, a, a pattern of, of where the rays got concentrated by the lens effect of that bottle. And those are called caustics. So if we want to render them, you know, that would be very unlikely if you were renting from your viewpoint and looking at that table and then trying to pick a diffuse reflection ray that it would go through the bottle and refract exactly to hit the sun. And that's because the specular part, you know, perfect refraction is also in a sense specular. It's a very small angle or even zero angle. That would be better to start from the photons, from the sun. Because then they'll already, ref if they hit the, the bottle, they'll refract. In fact, you could, if you were only interested in that particular caustic, you could aim them directly at the bottle. We'll talk about that in the future, too. You could start from the, the light source, refract or reflect off this very shiny or almost perfectly smooth surface, and hit a diffuse surface and deposit the energy there. So in that case, it's better to start from the light source. So depending on what paths you're trying to get, it may be better to start photons from your eye, from the light source, or sort of backwards photons from your eye. And bidirectional path tracing tries to do both, and then combine them in the middle, and somehow include all the effects that you can get, either the ones that are most efficiently done by tracing from your eye, or the ones that are most efficiently done by tracing from the light source. Okay, so details of that later. The last thing I want to do today is talk about how to do the homework for those of you, and, and somebody came to my office this morning asking for the details, how to take the ray tracing scheme from the book and turn it into the lens thing, because, I'm not from the book, from this reference code. The idea is the reference code started, I, I'm just looking at the pinhole camera model, and we had a look at point, point and an eye point, and a camera up vector. And the look direction was the unit vector gotten from taking look at minus i. And then we had a u and a v. And U could be, if we had a camera up vector, this U was cross look direction. Um, and V was cross U look direction. And if we normalize them, so Y over the absolute value of them, they have a call to normalize it. And this guy got normalized too. So these are three unit vectors, U, V, and, and look direction. I should put that here. which are basically the x, y, z axis of the camera. So I guess it's a left-handed coordinate system the way I've drawn it, where look direction corresponds to the z axis. OK, so uh, why don't I, instead of calling it u, assume these have been normalized, u dot normalize and v dot normalize. I'm just copying the code. 
And, and, and let me change it. U len equals U star um, len U star a tangent of the half angle of U, which is a sort of a magnification factor. If the half angle of U is 45 degrees, it will be exactly 1. Otherwise, it's basically the width of the thing you actually see if the screen was one unit in front of your eye, right? So here's a unit vector, and imagine a screen here. And this, so this distance is one along here. And now, depending on how, how wide and high it is, you have a smaller or larger uh, angle of view. And length is the multiplication factor you have to do to go from the origin of the screen to the edge of the screen. So this is not, their, their original U isn't a unit vector. But I'm going to just make, just to keep them. So then this code had a point on a screen given say x goes from minus 1 to 1 and y goes from minus 1 to 1 if it's a square screen. Otherwise, it depends on the aspect ratio. Um, but they actually multiply it times the aspect ratio. So their y actually goes between 0 and 1, minus 1 and 1. Then what is the 3D coordinates of a point here? Well, it's going to be this vector plus a displacement that depends on those x and y vectors. So um, the point, uh, what, what do I call it here? Um, say, I don't know, k. k is i plus a vector, which is look direction one unit times that to get to this plane and then in this plane we're going to add x times u len which is a vector uh, scalar multiple of this vector so they're overloading these scale this vector times scalar multiplication I'm not putting vector signs it depends on these u and v are vectors so vector And this is point plus y times v len. So this point k is on the screen. And the direction that your viewing ray is going to go in this naive lensless thing is k minus i. I guess it has to be normalized, right, to make it a unit vector. So normalize Okay, so how can we change this so that it works for the lens? So first of all, Correct me if I'm wrong, if you're photographers, and I'm, I'm not a really a photographer. We have the focal length of the lens, which is how far you would have to put the image plane from the lens to make it focus at infinity. Right? So parallel rays would come in and converge here. And then we have the diameter of the lens and the ratio of D to F is the f-stop. Is that right, or is it f to d? Uh, let's see. Smaller f-stops make wider things. So f over d must be f-stop, right? The lens is wider if your f2 is wider than f22 or something. So it must be like this. So that means if you solve for d, d equals uh, f over f-stop. That's the diameter of the lens, so radius of the lens is one half of that. So, you know, if you were a photographer, you would give this f and f-stop in there as for your lens thing. And then, 
actually, when you control the lens by turning that focus ring, you're changing the distance of the film plane to be I instead of F. And then you can compute the distance of the actual plane of focus. Right? If this is starting closer, see. No, the I's got to be farther than F to actually make it converge, right? Here is I like this. Then these things start here, and they're, they're converging at a finite distance instead of an infinite distance. If they're actually converging to the plane of focus, and I had the equation 1 over P plus 1 over I equals 1 over F. So when you control the camera, you're actually moving this lens farther or closer from the film plane. And that determines the plane of focus. But on your input variables, it might be easier. And in fact, I graded three of the four homeworks that were already turned in. And what they did was specify the distance of this focal plane here. So that's this distance p. And, and you know, for, for your purposes, that's just as good as having things specifying i and solving for p. Okay, so what are we really going to do here in terms of the recipe I gave? Um, you're going to pick a point on the lens. So I have to have this lens point. Well, one way to do it is with R and theta. Maybe this is, this is the capital lens, radius of the lens. And you're going to take a fraction of that. For those people who did, did anybody do the jittered sampling where they actually made sectors? Yes, yeah, some people did. So how are you going to find this ratio? Or say, say you had a, I mean, it's the same as if this radius was 1. We just end up multiplying it by R. How do you find given a random number between 0 and 1, how do you map it to these radii to make these bunch up here? Somebody said it. Say it louder. Square root. Square root of, of a random number u. So the actual radius of the point on the lens should be square root of, say, d rand 48. And then we'll multiply it. That's, that's if it were between 0 and 1. If it's between 0 and R, we'll multiply it by whatever this radius was that was specified for the lens. And theta, the, the angle here, how do you specify that? That's uniformly distributed. So that's 2 pi times another random number. Okay, so given these two numbers, what we want to do is we want to write a routine that will start with a pixel on the screen and go out into the world because the X and Y stuff that I was using on the screen <coughs> and on the lens is with respect to this coordinate frame with these three unit vectors. And we have to transform it to a ray going out into the world. And so if I'm going to draw, I don't know, let me think about my picture here now. I'm going to have a lens here. And I'm going to have an image plane at a distance I from the lens. And I'm going to have a fake image plane at distance 1 from the lens on which I've actually got my pixels, right? Because the, the way that this is thinking of it, we're thinking of pixels in front of the lens. And probably I should draw, this is actually tilted with respect to the world coordinate system. So I have to remember when I draw this picture, I've got U and V in this direction and look direction going this way. And so what I want to do is my I coordinate is right here at the center of the lens, right? In terms of the 
original viewing scheme where the lens is in front of us at the distance, I mean, where the, where the, the, the uh, imaginary plane on X, where X and Y are giving my, my uh, window is one unit in front because that, that look direction vector that gave that distance was a unit vector. And now I'm going to find an X and Y here basically is, well, it's really X times len and Y times len times aspect because of the, my fudge, right, for my field of view. So in this coordinate system, these are the coordinate system, which means that this point, wherever it is, what are, did I have a name for my lens point Q? I'll call it lens point. The coordinates of that lens point, I guess, are uh, x times len times u. So first of all, the lens point is on this plane somewhere. And that plane, we start with the point as a, and, and add on a vector look, director, look direction. And that's to get from the, from the origin at the eye to one unit in front of it. And then we have the uh, x times len times, uh, what did they call it? U, U uh, times u. That's my x times this u len plus y. I guess I could write it times v len. Well, these, these, this, these are, this is a unit vector, but now this one isn't because I sort of put that in already. Now, how am I going to get my point on this plane here that corresponds to it, right? We're supposed to trace the ray from the pixel, either this version of the pixel on this imaginary image plane or right through the center of the lens going back to the point on the actual image plane. And we're trying to find out where that ray actually hits the image plane. That's point Q. So it seems to me we have to make Q equals I. It starts at the I. And then we go look director of how much. Instead of one unit, we're actually P units. Because this direction is P units from the uh, center of the lens. Uh, and now, I guess we have P times each of these things, too. And that's going to get where we hit this point Q. And now, um, Let's see. This isn't. I did this wrong. This isn't the lens point. Uh, that's that's. This is the. Uh, this is the image point. Um, what we really want is a lens point. So what we're going to do is we'll we'll change this to be lens camera instead of pinhole camera. And it's going to return array. And it's going to depend on this render context, which I guess is where you look up the look direction and the U and the Y and the V that were generated when you specified the camera. I'm going to leave that off. Depends on doubles X, Y, R, and theta. Right, so in addition to picking your jittered sample, you pick a corresponding jittered R and theta if you're jittering on the lens and you're doing that permutation of your jittering box or whatever. Basically, what we're trying to do is create the ray that goes out into the scene. And so the lens point is going to be, let's see, the lens point is on this plane here. So it's going to be I plus 
plus u, u is my unit vector, and I'm multiplying that by r, the radius of the lens, times cosine theta, and then I'm adding the unit vector v times the radius of the lens times sine. I guess I wrote it out, theta over there. So write it, write it out here too. So is that right? That's a corresponding point in this u v coordinate system. Now I'm make, keeping them unit vectors, unlike the one in the book where they already multiplied them and called them by the same name. Um, so let's see. That means my ray direction is normalize. Um, well, let me take normalize it later. It's going to be this point minus the lens point. So I have, I, have, I have a lens point somewhere on the plane of this lens, and this is actually the, the vector I'm tracing out into the scene. So it's going to be Q minus lens point. I guess I call it lens PT. And then I have to normalize it. So it's ray direction. I'm, I think I'm, I'm, I'm not used to this C++ notation. Ray direction dot normalize. OK, so now what is my ray? At the end of the code in the uh, reference stuff, they had finally a ray that they may be where you returning. So return ray. So it starts at the lens point and goes out in this ray direction. And that's the ray you're going to trace into the scene. So I think that's the way to implement the lens camera using this scheme that came out of that uh, SIGGRAPH paper in 1984 that I put on the blackboard before, but in the coordinate system of UV look direction, if I haven't made a mistake here. I mean, already I see that it's a little different than what I wrote in the notes because I was rederiving it as I got here. But, um, you know, this guy is a point. This guy is a point. This guy is a vector, because the difference of two points is a vector. The sum of a point and a vector is a point, and so forth. So is this similar to what people did? The people who did the assignment did it that way. But some of the people, somebody who couldn't do the assignment came to my office this morning, and I figured I'd detail it out to help those of you who are still struggling. If you didn't finish it, by midnight, you know, then you have until, I guess, Monday at midnight, and you'll only lose a point. So. Keep trying. That's it for today.